let's get started. Let, uh, welcome, welcome to CAPP seminar. So let me introduce you to this speaker, uh, the Raksha Hadwada. Uh, she got a, a PhD from the Purdue University in 2015. And then she worked at the Fermidab uh, to develop some, some, some tribute uh, based uh, <coughs> the, the photon detector and then, and then quantum noise and limited amplifiers and stuff like that. And then recently he joined the uh, IIT, uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology, as a uh, assistant professor, which I congratulate you on. Uh, and then her research is basically uh, uh, quantum information uh, science using the qubits. And then using that, you know, she developed, you know, for the detectors and then the amplifiers. And now she has you know, quite a good experience in JP as well. So, so she is one of the members of the ADMX co in collaboration. So she recently she wrote, you know, very nice uh, paper about the uh, development that has been done uh, at, at ADMX. And then, so today we, we invited her and then they listened uh, what is going on in, in ADMX. Yeah, let's welcome her. Thank you, Songwoo. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. I, I would like to thank IBS and CAP for organizing this uh, Zoom session. And uh, even though COVID has robbed us from many uh, different opportunities of meeting in person, I am actually happy regardless uh, to be talking to you about this ADMX experiment today. Um, so I was a postdoc in ADMX, uh, University of Washington from 2015 to 2018. And then I joined Fermilab and I also worked half time in ADMX uh, until uh, recently, until August of this year. Uh, that's when I joined this new position with Fermilab and IIT. So uh, since I was asked by Sungwoo and um, 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 and, and the team to give you an overview of the uh, progress in Axion dark matter experiment. Um, and and uh, the, the highlight is basically the paper that came out. Uh, I'm going to mainly talk uh, about ADMX today. And so I'll focus on the outcome of those, uh, those two runs uh, highlighted in this paper that I mentioned mostly. And I'll also talk a little bit about the future uh, direction of some of the R&D that uh, ADMX is working on uh, that are also relevant. So um, let's see, let's get started. So um, here is an outline of the talk. So I will first touch a little bit about a uh, little bit on the dark matter and axion. Obviously, you guys know way too much about axions by now. Um, I'm familiar with CAP's work also. So um, um, I will just talk of you know the very basic uh, basic introduction um, on dark matter and axions, um, and I will talk mainly about these two runs that I mentioned and some of the R&D for next runs and um, I will conclude after that. So uh, just the general overview and I apologize if you have heard about this way too much but uh, I figured you know since some of you might be just coming here to hear about dark matter axioms and this experiment I figured I should actually throw this anyway so bear with me while I talk about just the regular uh, background that you have heard hundreds of times by now probably so as we all know dark matter uh, constitutes um, this 25% uh, or so energy density of the universe and um, its properties are <clears throat> it is non-standard model particle. Uh, it's weakly interacting, can't be detected with traditional observational astronomy tools um, because it doesn't reflect, absorb, or emit light. And uh, it makes up a large structure of the universe. Uh, the type of dark matter that is relevant to us is called this cold dark matter, uh, which forms clumps and uh, most of the structure of the universe. And if discovered, axions will be the lightest particle um, they will be lighter than neutrinos. So uh, what are some of the evidences of dark matter? <clears throat> so we all know 
that uh, there is evidence from gravitational lensing, uh, so light bent by distant galaxies, uh, light that passes from distant galaxies uh, through some um, other nearby galaxy, it bends, and we know that uh, the bending actually doesn't correspond to just the baryonic matter, but uh, also some extra matter, and that kind of tells us that there is this uh, non-baryonic matter. Um, and so there is also these evidence from galaxy clusters rotation curve by looking at the orbital speed of galaxy and stars versus their distance from the center. What we see is uh, it's, there is deviation from just the matter being baryonic matter, uh, indicating that there's more matter in these galaxies. And also there is uh, the, the, uh, the indication from shape of the cosmic microwave power spectrum. So if you look at the fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background temperature versus angular scale, uh, this also indicates existence of dark matter because uh, when you compare the model with the dark matter and the observation um, that, that matches nicely. So we, we kind of have these probes that have indicated that there is matter out there uh, that is not just the baryonic matter that we think of uh, or that we can see. So uh, the dark matter parameter space is uh, huge uh, in terms of possible candidates. Um, you know, it, it can be all these uh, medium-sized black holes, WIMPs, dark matter, and then on the lighter uh, area here, on the lighter side, uh, it can be something like QCD axion. And since you guys are also looking for axions, I'm sure you're all really familiar with this. So this is uh, this is the regime that we are all. Uh, we all axion looking, our axion searching people are focused on. And um, I will be focusing mainly on this micro EV to milli EV range because that's the uh, range that ADMX is operating on right now. So um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I'll be focused on this and there are many different types of uh, probes that uh, probe axions in this regime uh, and axion couples to electromagnetic fields, fermions and gluon fields. So you can uh, use different probes like NMR based probes and ENM probes, torsion balance, atomic interferometry, et cetera, to look for axions. And the type of um, probe that we use in ATMX is called uh, this uh, electromagnetic uh, probe. And uh, anybody who's using these haloscope based sources are using ENM uh, probe. And this is just showing you where we are looking at in terms of mass. So, Let's talk a little bit about how the naming came about. So turns out Frank Wilczek actually named Axion after detergent because he thought it cleaned the strong CP problem in QCD, like the detergent cleans uh, dirty dishes. So that's actually interesting fact. I tried to look for Axion detergent here and I couldn't, I can't say I found one. So if you see one, um, that's the history behind this particle naming. Um, so just a little bit about uh, the, the strong CP problem. So first of all, axions were produced around inflation. Um, and um, uh, uh, so, so to go into a little bit deeper into the standard model QCD and CP, uh, um, strong CP problem. So standard model QC, QCD uh, allows for the CP violating parameter in terms of theta, which can have any, any value from zero to two pi. A non-zero value of theta implies CP violation in strong interaction. Uh, that means neutron's electric dipole moment is a non-zero value. However, experimental upper limit on this parameter is very, very small. So this implies that theta, if it exists, is a really, really small value. So this discrepancy between the value that theta can have uh, versus this, uh, this, this possible uh, value uh, that is really, really small, uh, or limit, I should say, not a value, uh, this discrepancy is called this strong CV problem. And so to address this issue, theta was promoted to a field by Peche and Quinn, um, adding this new U1 global symmetry to the standard model uh, and which uh, gets spontaneously broken to give this uh, axion particle, uh, give rise to this axion particle. So looking at the 
uh, mass parameter space that I mentioned earlier, kind of zooming in in that range. Uh, so, so let's look at some of the experiments that uh, look for axions. So here on the y-axis is the axion photon coupling constant, on the x-axis is uh, mass in EV. And so you see the heloscope experiments, uh, like the one you're, you yourself are involved, are kind of at the forefront of axion sources. Um, and so we're all looking at this nice uh, axion window that is kind of um, on the higher mass regime. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's constrained by the supernova 1987A cooling. Um, so the, the idea being um, if, there was, uh, if there were axions, the heat transport uh, during this cooling uh, would have been uh, contributed by axions also. The, the cooling, uh, in addition to neutrinos, would have been um, due to axions also. So that, that limits how uh, higher the mass of this axion can be. And on the lower um, mass uh, regime, uh, there is this Planck scale that kind of tells you like how low you can go. So we kind of operate in this area uh, where the pre-inflationary and post-inflationary um, axions both, uh, both uh, um, are um, possible. So, so we're kind of in that intersection here, slightly higher than where ADMX is operating right now. So this is all a good area to look for axions. And there are other experiments like uh, light signing through the wall type of experiment uh, where you use uh, laser um, and magnets and then you try to convert photons uh, in the presence of a strong magnetic field to axions and then you, uh, you put a wall. So the idea is since axions are weakly interacting, they pass right through and then you convert it back to photons on the other side, whereas the photons, uh, they, uh, they are uh, stopped by this, uh, this, this wall. So there are those kind of stuff. There are these, um, these other um, solar axion sources, etc. So um, since ADMX operates on this, and uh, there are these haystack and cap, these kind of successful experiments here, I'm going to talk mainly uh, about this, uh, this source over here. Um, and so uh, let me talk about one more thing. So I should mention that uh, there have been these uh, analytical and lattice predictions um, of axion mass uh, from theorists, uh, given that it makes 100% of dark matter and a uh, bunch of these uh, theorists actually predict the mass to be somewhere around here. So this seems to indicate that this is actually a sweet spot to be uh, looking at. And I think Gray Ribka has a paper on this, so feel free to check that out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, how we detect axions. Um, so axions, um, you know, like were produced after the Big Bang. They are everywhere, including our local Milky Way galactic halo. Uh, they are they get kicked around in this gravitational potential, and um, their their velocity is a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution uh, with a mean of about ten to the power minus three uh, c. Um, and so their density in this local galactic halo is really high, like 10 to the power 14 per cubic centimeter, and their lifetime is 10 to the power 42 years. So it makes perfect sense for us to actually not try to create these axions in the lab, but rather look for these axions that are already there in our local galactic halo, because their lifetime is so long. Um, and so the good way, a good way to think about axions is to think of them as these gigantic uh, axion waves that actually also are oscillating them, themselves. So this, this axion wave you can think of as this football stadium size, um, size, which is about like 100 meter long. Um, and this oscillating axion field acts as a space filling current source in this external magnetic field. And uh, this you can plug into this uh, um, equation and um, the type of interaction that we are looking for is axion converging into two photons. Um, and um, so, yeah, this is the electromagnetic interaction I mentioned earlier. So this is how we try to look for axions. So we look, you use this something called heloscope you are all familiar with. Um, 
So haloscope, I don't know why the name stands, but I think it's basically mean you're looking for axions uh, from the local halo, galactic halo. Uh, so you would just harness axions from uh, local galactic halo in this, uh, in this microwave cavity. Uh, it's a high quality factor microwave cavity um, made up of copper. Um, and when the resonance frequency of this uh, microwave cavity matches to that of this uh, uh, photon coming from axion in a very strong magnetic field, uh, you, you, it converts into this photon. So you, you resonantly, resonantly enhance this conversion process when this frequency matches. So you have this external magnetic field B that uh, this uh, cavity is contained in, without which you can't actually convert axons into photons. And you have this tuning rod that actually tunes the TM010 mode of this microwave cavity. Um, and this is a very necessary, um, um, necessary uh, parameter or um, property because as you saw, we actually don't know what the mass of axion is. We just have this constraint that is very wide, uh, broad in mass. So we kind of like have to, you know, go step by step and look for axion in this huge parameter space. And so tunability of all our devices and experiment is a must. Um, and you have this antenna that picks up the power deposited in this manner. Uh, and it's amplified by these quantum amplifiers first. And then I don't show the other type of amplifier here, but the, the, it's the second stage amplifier, are these hemped amplifiers. And uh, it's digitized and um, it's converted into this power spectrum. And on the y-axis, we have this power. And then on the x-axis, you have frequency. And then what you expect is this characteristic peak centered around whatever the mass of the axion is. <clears throat> so that's kind of what you um, expect to see, see. And of course, the signal to noise ratio depends on the uh, power of axion. Uh, and this is the uh, noise, uh, which is uh, proportional to this something called system noise. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so it's proportional to quantities like integration time, axion line width, coupling constant, uh, density of axion, frequency, quality factor of this um, cavity. Uh, this is a form factor, how well the electric and magnetic field align inside this and um, the, the strength of the magnetic field squared, the volume of the cavity. This comes from this integration time here. And the main point is the system noise temperature is what you want to minimize. And all these parameters is what you want to maximize uh, in order to uh, get a good signal to noise ratio. And so be before moving on to uh, ADMX detector in particular, uh, let me just briefly mention that uh, ADMX collaboration has a dozen or so of these uh, various institutions uh, like uh, Fermilab, University of Florida, um, obviously University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, we also have Washington University, St. Louis, uh, who is a newer um, uh, partner. And we also have uh, University of Western Australia. I don't know how many people actually knew that. They have joined recently. And then we have also um, this, uh, um, this uh, a university uh, from Germany. And uh, yeah, so those are new partners we have now. And uh, we are about a dozen or so, and we're still growing. So it has become um, bigger in the last few years. And so I should mention that uh, ADMX is uh, the only DOE generation to dark matter experiment with published science results. Um, I will be talking about what has been published in a bit. Uh, we continue to maintain DOE support during challenging fiscal times for uh, uh, research and project. Um, and we have also successfully put together this proposal um, in this Dark Matter New Initiatives. Um, and uh, this addresses the ADMX 2 to 4 gigahertz design. Uh, we have been funded for engineering and design studies for two years, uh, and the total of this uh, proposal is 15 million. So um, I'll briefly talk like what the, some of the design things are going on for this two to four gigahertz uh, axion sources. 
So some of the timeline and frequency covers of various runs uh, I wanted to um, show you. So run one way we finished in 2018, we actually published in 2018, that covered 645 to 680 megahertz. Uh, run one B, uh, we published in 2019, covered 680 to 800 megahertz. Run one C, we are actually uh, doing right now, we are in the middle of this run. Uh, we are supposed to be looking for axions in 960 to 1020 megahertz. Um, and um, this is delayed a little bit by COVID. And this run 1D, we are supposed to cover uh, from 1020 to 1390 megahertz. Um, so it was scheduled for 2021. And run 2A, uh, we are supposed to uh, go from 1390 to 1900 megahertz in 2023. So a little bit more on the ongoing run 1C. So it started in February of 2020 this year. Uh, we are searching for axions in 960 to 1020 megahertz regime. Uh, and we are able to reach DFSC sensitivity, uh, but the scan speed is slightly slower than we'd like. Uh, this, uh, it's, it's because of the suboptimal JPA performance. Uh, there was some field mismatch between bugging coil and main magnet earlier this year. Uh, that might have trapped some magnetic flux uh, and the troubleshooting in, is in progress, in progress, but uh, of course everybody um, and everything is delayed by COVID, right? So we're trying to troubleshoot this, but uh, we're actually uh, uh, taking science data right now. So in the next slide, I'll just talk about uh, some of the ADMX technology that we used in run 1A and B that are the ones that we have already completed, not the one we are in right now. And then I will also talk a little bit about ongoing R&D for future runs. So um, as you all know, um, and maybe like not all of you, but some of you actually have seen this experiment in person, I think. Uh, ADMX experiment is located at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, here is the picture of the inside, the detector that has been pulled out. Um, this is hanging on this clean room uh, or semi-clean room where all the work uh, takes place. So um, all the, uh, you know, swapping of the different uh, devices, electronics, etc., cetera, um, takes place here. And this is the pit uh, where there is this eight Tesla magnet underground. And this, this lid comes out and all this, this insert actually goes inside. And that's where, how we provide this uniform magnetic field. Um, so that's that. And so this detector cross section looks like this. Um, here on the left, uh, this detector was just uh, pulled out from the bore of the magnet and it's being craned inside this, uh, on top of this, uh, this clean room. And so the cross section shows you um, the copper microwave cavity where axion converts into photons. The tuning rods are here. Uh, the microwave cavity um, uh, is this high quality factor cavity I talked about. And this uh, antennas pick up this very small power that is deposited by these axions. Um, and this dilution refrigerator cools the cavity as well as all the electronics inside here uh, to millikelvin temperature. Um, and uh, it's about 100 millikelvin right now. And these squid amplifier packets are these quantum amplifiers that actually amplify uh, this very small signal without adding too much noise itself. I will talk a little bit more about those also. And there's this field cancellation coil that actually provides close to zero magnetic field because these squid amplifiers are highly sensitive to external magnetic field. And since this is a gigantic dipole magnet here, uh, you have residual field in this area. So we need this field cancellation coil. So the main technologies uh, are these uh, quantum amplifiers, uh, this dilution refrigerator, and this microwave cavity. And I'll talk uh, more about these these technologies next. So to start off with uh, the microwave cavity, um, so currently we use this uh, 136 liters copper cavity. Uh, it has this tu tuning rod uh, that can be moved around um, and uh, shifted in um, its frequency. 
um, and uh, the quality factor is about 50,000. Um, and so this, this same cavity we have been using to, uh, for several runs because you can actually change the diameter of this tuning rod uh, and change the frequency of this, uh, this uh, fr uh, resonance frequency of this cavity. So we plan to use the same cavity uh, in the current run and also the future run, run 1D. However, from run 2A, we're planning on using a four cavity array and power combining technique. Um, and here is a picture of the prototype of this four cavity array that we're trying to uh, implement next. Uh, this is just an aluminum four cavity array uh, that is at FNL, uh, which is Fermilab um, for now. Uh, it's being tested at 4K cryostat. Uh, it was fabricated and uh, the preliminary tests were done at University of Florida. Um, and the cavity locking system for these cavities is being worked on uh, at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So we need this cavity locking system because, so first of all, going back a little bit, uh, since I mentioned earlier, the axion is this gigantic wave um, of particles uh, that's about like 100 uh, meters or so. So it makes perfect sense for us to actually have these little volumes of cavity and power combine these cavities because it's this, this axion is current over a very long large distance uh, and this is a very small um, volume still and um, so so you can do this and uh, so the main issue is the cavity they have to be locked within certain frequency um, and that's the main challenge so that part is being worked on by pacific northwest national laboratory um, and the other thing we are implementing for this is uh, these piezo motor actuators. Uh, they are replacing the current stepper motors uh, that we use for ADMX. Um, and this is primarily for the reason that these stepper motors are bulky and also uh, they have uh, high thermal dissipation. So these piezo motors are, uh, are uh, supposed to actually solve those issues. And this 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 system is being tested at uh, Fermilab uh, in a 4K cryostat, as I mentioned. And once this prototype is uh, done, we'll move on to the actual uh, cavities. And in parallel, there are some other um, exploration of uh, other type of cavities is also taking place. So we all Axion community know that uh, we are in a lookout for high quality factor cavities because of this uh, this uh, resonant enhancements uh, enhancement in this uh, high quality factor uh, volume that we have, uh, and so we are exploring these uh, superconducting cavities which actually have a very high quality factor, but um, you know so they don't they are not compatible with high magnetic field, and so here at Fermilab uh, some people are actually trying to see how much of degradation. Uh, can happen uh, in magnetic field uh, and if it will still be higher than let's say like a, a normal copper cavity so that's kind of one area and then there are some people who are working on photonic band gap cavities uh, which are also supposed to uh, be compatible with magnetic field uh, and uh, sh should have high uh, quality factor so there are those directions that are also being worked on right now for future runs so the run to a system that we're gearing up for um, in the next couple of years, uh, the, this is a schematic of uh, what we plan to do. We'll have this four cavity array system. Uh, and so these systems, these cavities would be separate. However, they would be power combined. So this is a power combining unit. Um, they would have their own um, means of probing so this uh, this is a weak port um, all of those uh, will be able to be probed separately through this weak port and uh, they go through this switch that uh, will allow us to look at the hot load heated load um, resistor uh, versus the cavity and then you know the, this use will go through circulator and the first stage amplifier which is a parametric amplifier um, and then it will just um, go to your output um, hemp amplifier. So that's kind of a general schematic for uh, our, uh, our planned run to a system. 
And so one of the important electronics for this uh, RUN2 system is this uh, power combiner uh, system. Uh, so this is designed and fabricated by Washington University at St. Louis. Um, here is a picture of that. Um, and so this is used to be, this is planned to be used along with this four cavity array, like here, shown here. Um, and turns out it's actually not trivial to have something like this with uh, pretty low uh, insertion loss um, and uh, that, ha that can be used in cryogenic environment. So this was uh, fabricated at uh, Washington University, St. Louis. Um, so that's that. I'll talk a little bit more about the cryogenic el electronics and quantum amplifiers next. So here is a schematic that I pulled from this recent paper that I put out uh, that was used for run 1B. Um, so maybe for a lot of you, this looks familiar. So there, uh, you know, our uh, lines, so subcavities here and this um, power um, is um, absorbed by this antenna, goes through switch. Uh, circulators, etc., and then first stage amplifier, and then go back to hint. Um, and you have this hot load uh, resistor that I talked about earlier that can be switched uh, for, to and from this cavity. And so all of this is actually housed in uh, something we call Squidadel. Um, so this is just this 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 weird structure here, and it's weird because it has to actually fit inside this um, helium. Uh, reservoir here. So this, this is a 4K uh, helium reservoir. Um, so this, this is the part that's actually uh, a magnetic field free region. So we, we kind of like have to fit all of our sensitive uh, magnetic field sensitive electronics, including the quantum amplifiers in this volume. Um, and here are these RF feed throughs that all the lines come in and out of this, this section over here. And then all the DC wiring, et cetera, also come in and out of uh, this flange over here. So that's that. A little bit on this uh, detector core design. So um, for, for the sake of uh, consistency, I'll be just calling it detector core rather than squidadel because it's just a weird name. Uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, for ourselves. So here is this designed uh, uh, detector core at Fermilab. So I lit this design uh, and this is actually taking data right now for run 1C. And so this was important because we're, we do past due for this design that thermalized better with the, the, um, the insert. If you notice um, our uh, temperature here, cavity temperature, and the electronics actually were not the same temperature. So this was uh, one of the issues we actually wanted to address for a very long time. And so I myself laid this design of this new detector core um, with uh, better thermalization. Uh, we, a uh, bunch of uh, Fermilab uh, cryogenic engineers and design RF engineers, we sat together and and made sure that uh, it had all the components and characteristics for better thermalization. So inside this hexagonal space uh, are these quantum amplifiers. This is the stuff that goes inside this hexagonal um, air uh, volume. So this is uh, traveling with parametric amplifier here, and then this is Josephson parametric amplifier here. Um, and there is new metal shield that kind of um, encapsulates this and all of that goes inside this hexagonal shield. And then there is circulators, uh, directional couplers, switches, etc., just all outside. Um, and so this actually changed, decreased our um, temperature, the temperature of all these electronics by a huge amount. So it went from over 200 millikelvin to very close to the cavity actually around 100 millikelvin for the current run. So this was a huge improvement that we made and one of the highlights of the uh, paper that I just submitted uh, earlier in archive. And so um, run 1C, 1D and 2A detector core design and plans. Uh, we have kind of uh, dedicated uh, Washington University St. Louis uh, for that task. So they are leading this, uh, this design, detector core design. Um, I don't lead that design anymore. 
uh, but I, I do uh, indeed actually work with them. So um, in addition to that, they also, also are um, responsible for fabrication of this uh, Josephson parametric amplifiers and uh, including this flux pump Josephson parametric amplifiers. So Washington University St. Louis uh, has um, three PIs or so who are um, who, who have backgrounds in quantum information science, so they, they can build their own parametric amplifiers. Um, they, they, they know the low noise systems, et cetera. So this is actually a uh, really neat, uh, neat uh, thing that they can do, that they can build our own parametric amplifiers. And so they are also working on um, items that are very important, uh, like cryogenic filtering system, like DC filtering, and then switch controller, um, many of us who have actually used these uh, commercial switch controller know that uh, our systems actually can't handle too much of uh, heat dump that comes from these uh, switch controllers just uh, powering up with a huge power dump, right? So we have to actually um, do our own, uh, make our own switch controllers with certain pulses um, to minimize the heat dump in our system. So those kind of things are all worked on um, uh, uh, by this uh, Washington University St. Louis group. And so they are also testing um, the, this this um, detector core that they have designed in uh, in a magnet system. So that's all, another thing we actually never did before. We never actually tested all this uh, detector core in a magnetic field. Uh, and they are also exploring uh, items like squeezing um, or operating this Josephson parametric amplifier in a uh, phase sensitive uh, way. Um, to gain in scan speed, like the haystack experiment has done, right? So they are kind of also interested in that. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, they're actually uh, one of the leading groups uh, in US in quantum information science. I think they can, um, they are well equipped to do so. And so here is a kind of example plot of like what they have been doing uh, with uh, uh, Josephson parametric amplifiers. So they have this, uh, here's a plot of this like gain optimization for one of the JPAs that they made recently. And here is a picture of um, a dilution refrigerator setup uh, there where um, this this uh, detector core has been mounted for testing, etc. So, So they are leading this effort now. And they have um, a couple of dilution refrigerator dedicated for this. So I wanted to br touch briefly on uh, the, some of the uh, quantum amplifiers that we have used uh, in the past and that we're using now in ADMX. So we used for RUN1C in the paper, I mentioned this MicroStrip uh, Squid Amplifier or MSA in short, uh, which was um, this uh, different kind of amplifier than the Josephson parametric amplifier. So this is uh, just this resonator inductively coupled to a squid. Um, this is a DC squid. Um, and um, so it also had this tunable varactor uh, that you could tune uh, that would change the frequency. So it, it made the device tunable and uh, it had slightly less tunability than the parametric amplifier. Um, but that's what we used for uh, our run 1A. And for run 1B, we used Josephson parametric amplifier uh, which is an oscillator whose inductance is modulated um, and you amplify a weak signal by pumping uh, on it and its tunability is uh, about several uh, hundred megahertz per device and this is we have what we have been using since run 1b um, so we are we have discontinued this and we are just using this technology right now so why do we use these quantum amplifiers? And also this might be something that you probably already know, but I think I should just say a little bit. Um, so it's, it's, it's like this uh, fundamental uncertainty principle, right? So uh, when you are measuring two non-commuting qu quantities like this position and momentum, you have this fundamental uncertainty on how well you can measure uh, me measure them, right? So similar to this, when you're measuring the uh, electromagnetic waves phase and amplitude um, simultaneously, you have this un fundamental uncertainty that's called quantum noise. Uh, 
So that's 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 what we're talking about. And so these amplifiers are um, desirable because if operated in very low temperatures, they are only limited by this fundamental quantum noise limit. Um, so that's actually really nice because again, going back, our signal is super small, right? So we we want to minimize external noise as much as possible. And so looking at the system noise temperature, uh, it's it depends on the amplifier noise temperature as well as the physical temperature. So we want to minimize both of this. That's why we are, um, this is so important. And going back to signal to noise ratio, this system noise has to be small. That's why we care so much about squeezing um, every millikelvin out of these amplifiers and physical temperature, since that determines the sensitivity of the experiment. And this also seems to be the most involved aspect of analysis also, uh, because it's actually not a straightforward thing to measure. So um, the reason I say that is because uh, the temperature of these things are slightly different, like this uh, cavity and then the electronics. I mean, here it shows a lot different, but uh, recently it's actually pretty close to uh, pretty close now. But um, the reason it's a little complicated is because of how different they are. And so the most important analysis parameter for the system noise temperature are these um, characterizing the edge fit uh, noise temperature. Uh, characterizing the gain of the quantum amplifiers uh, and the noise temperature of the quantum amplifiers themselves. So these are kind of the procedure that we focus on while we, um, while we determine the uh, system noise temperature. So just to give you an example from the paper, um, so we first, to, to understand the system noise temperature, we first characterize the edge fit noise temperature, uh, which is the second stage amplifier. Um, for, for those of you who are not familiar with that term. Um, so we do something called this hot load measurement um, where you heat the uh, millikelvin electronics and uh, you kind of see something like you expect, right? So the power actually rises up and then when it starts cooling down, it goes down and um, you actually do see this, what you, what you expect, this uh, straight uh, line uh, when you look at the power versus the temperature, right? So this is all good. This is kind of how we characterize our edge fits. And then um, we also optimize these quantum amplifiers uh, to, to uh, get the lowest system noise temperature. So we bias them. We have these automated bias plots where we um, tweak the different bias parameters like pump power, uh, so this is particularly for uh, Josephson parametric amplifier. Uh, bias current, and here you can see how it changes the gain. Um, and similarly, you can see here like how bias current changes the system noise temperature. So this is just an example. So we produce pro plots like that where you actually bias, change the different bias parameters and look at how uh, the system noise temperature changes and what gives you the lowest system noise temperature. So um, whatever gives you the lowest system noise temperature, that's the reason that you want to operate on. That's, and that's where we operate on. And so the signal to noise ratio looks like this. So now you have this you know, smallest system noise temperature and that will give you the biggest signal to noise ratio. And um, that's, that's what we do. So um, before going on to summarizing the steps, I also wanted to mention that uh, the dilution refrigerator that we have actually cools the cavity and electronics to about 90 millikelvin or 100 millikelvin. Um, and since 2018, we have been kind of consistently uh, operating it around this uh, 90 to 100 uh, millikelvin. So uh, it has been consistently working great. And again, going back why this is important, because your system noise temperature depends on it and uh, we want to minimize this. So the other thing that actually we are um, trying to kind of work on uh, at Fermilab is um, you, you know, the scan speed actually depends on this magnetic field uh, to the fourth power, right? So, so one easy way to actually increase the scan speed is to get a really high magnetic field uh, magnet. 
And so turns out it's actually not a trivial thing to get a very high magnetic field with a big volume to fit our experiment. And this is the, uh, this is the issue faced by all the Axion um, SERS communities. We want higher magnetic field, but uh, also higher volume. And so recently we were able to uh, discover this magnet from University of Illinois um, at Chicago. It's a 9.4 Tesla MRI magnet with 800 millimeter warm bore. Um, but we'll, we'll need to figure out some of the logistics of, first of all, it's horizontal. Um, so we'll need to figure out like how we fit um, the components here. Um, and it was inspected by the uh, Fermi Lab engineers in October. Uh, and we are kind of working out the logistics of if this will work and how to make this work. So uh, there have been some magnet sources going on and this is one of the promising ones that I wanted to mention quickly. So using all those cryogenic electronics and all that we have, um, we take data. And so a typical, typical uh, data taking cadence looks like this. So you have the tuned cavity and quantum amplifiers to the desired frequency that you want to look at that matches to the mass of axion. And you achieve the lowest system noise temperature. Like I said, you just bias your amplifiers to uh, the, the lowest system noise temperature you can have. And then you record the noise power spectra. You digitize it for some time. And then you repeat this until the desired signal to noise ratio is achieved. Uh, and you just like move in mass, do the same thing. You repeat the same procedure by moving in frequency or mass. And you analyze the data um, that involves filtering, convolving with axion line shape. And if you have any excess power, um, you rescan the wh wherever the excess power is uh, cited. Uh, and if this excess power candidate still persists, you individually look at that. Um, and there are many ways of telling if it's actually an axion or not. Um, like you know, you can you can turn the magnet off, uh, but most of the um, most of the random zitters or like uh, random excess power usually tend to go away when you rescan it again. So uh, so unless there is super persistent thing, uh, you don't actually have to turn the magnet off. So um, after that, you either put limits or discover axioms, right? So that's kind of like the general process that we follow. And so I wanted to mention uh, our results from run 1A and 1B. Uh, here is the plot on y-axis. We have this coupling constant again. And uh, on the x-axis, we have frequency in megahertz. And uh, run 1A is this orange one, run 1B is this green one. And uh, we covered frequency from 645 to um, 800 uh, in these two runs. And uh, of course we didn't discover axions, but uh, we were able to reach this DFSC sensitivity. Um, and the mass this corresponds is from 2.66 to uh, 3.3 micro AV roughly. And so we have a paper, the latest one being summarizing this in uh, physics, uh, physical review letters. Uh, this was published uh, last year. And so there is this, this lighter shaded reason is actually um, the, the bottom one is uh, from n-body simulation, whereas the top one is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution uh, for the line uh, shape of axioms. Um, this is different in that the bottom one is slightly narrower and then, uh, uh, yeah, so it gives you a slightly better, uh, better limit. And so this is, this is what has been completed uh, but stay tuned for the current results from Run 1C since we're still taking data uh, in 3 to 4.2 micro EV range. So it's actually, uh, sorry, it should have been 3.3, 3.3 to uh, 4.2 micro EV. That's our um, data taking right now. So, what would an axion signal look like? Um, so here is this synthetic axion generator software that we use to uh, simulate an axion signal 
that was ad added to real data. And so this is a really great way of actually verifying also if you can detect an axion or not. So on the top here, um, you have this bunch of uh, uh, spectra, power spectra, and you do have uh, DFSC and KSVZ um, uh, synthetic axion injected here, but you can you actually cannot see DFSC at all in this individual spectra. Uh, but then since they're stacked up here, you can kind of sort of see, but if you look at this individually, you can't really see much. But uh, if you t combine bunch of these power spectra, then it becomes obvious, right? So that's kind of like what we do. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of, uh, that shows you how axion signal will look like. If you look at individual spectra, nothing will appear, but if you take on data for a long time, it would appear and it would be centered around whatever the mass of the axion is. So, so that's kind of what we hope to uh, see. So in um, summary, there is a lot of uh, increased interest in um, axion, both in direct and indirect sources. Um, and uh, recently, uh, in many community reports, uh, the DOE HEP, uh, so, you know, Department of Energy, High Energy Physics community has shown a lot of interest on ultralight dark matter and axions um, and uh, has kind of... Uh, realize that this is actually a very important thing to look for. And also there is this quantum science uh, uh, program in uh, happening in the US. So there are these uh, uh, National Quant Quantum Institute. Uh, Fermilab is also part of uh, actually three of those and is leading one of those centers. Uh, those, the, the National Quantum Initiative has also realized that uh, that these uh, dark matters, ultralight dark matters, are interesting thing to look, and uh, quantum sensors can be actually particularly useful to look for this ultralight dark matter. And those of us who already work in this uh, axion search community, we we are well aware that these quantum sensors and devices like um, quantum amplifiers um, are essential in uh, in reaching this. Uh, uh, this this uh, axion search uh, in a reasonable amount of time, doing axion search in reasonable amount of time. So uh, so they have finally realized that, and there are a lot of us here uh, in this uh, Fermilab community who are interested in also single photon counting um, detectors for axion dark matter, which I didn't have a time to talk today because this is an overview of uh, ADMX mainly, but uh, you can actually evade some of the some of the limitations of this quantum noise limit by actually just counting photons and uh, randomizing the phase. So, so there, there is that avenue also uh, that involves using quantum sensors to look for ultralight dark matter. Um, so in general, there has been a substantial increase in Axion uh, research or interest in, in the U.S. lately. And so if Axions are discovered, obviously it will tell us about early universe. Um, you know, it can prove, uh, ex ex experiments like ours can prove very high energy scales. Um, and, you know, it will solve the strong CP problem, as I mentioned earlier, and this dark matter puzzle. So the future direction, uh, basically, you know, looking looking at ADMX, uh, will be investigating a lot of no novel methods and technologies, um, like the ones I mentioned, uh, you know, like for cavity and uh, other items, but also will be particularly uh, using these quantum sensors or investigating quantum sensors that will evade quantum noise limit, like the single photon sensors that I mentioned earlier. And so, um, so it will be a busy and exciting next few years for us here. And having said that, here are some of the peoples that have been working on in ADMX. And this is actually way older picture. So I must say this is just a small cross section of the total number of peoples right now. Uh, this was taken at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and thank you very much. And I welcome any questions.
the introduction it was, was very nice summary of, of ADMX experiment. Okay, so now it's uh, time for questions and comments. I have a couple of technical questions. Sure. Uh, actually, it's a little harder to hear. Can you make the sound slightly louder? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's about the first, it's about this cavity, uh, multiple cavity setup. Yes. You mentioned that they will be combined at cold. Yes. And uh, there is a, I saw there's a combiner setup and that's uh, some, uh, Combiner produced by uh, University of Washington. My question right. is, do you, do you, because just what I guess is, even though you try very hard to match all the lengths of the cable, etc., do you need to have some kind of uh, phase shifter at call to be able to match the phase of those lines? I think you're right. I think we would need some phase shifter to match those uh, cable lengths. I see. So, so I guess that would be a Little, little bit of a technical uh, issue in terms of like heat generation and so on. You yes. Know? Yes, you're right. I think so. Some of the details of this are still to be fleshed out. So to the first order, this is the plan. But yes, you're right. There are some some smaller details that will make it a little bit more complicated. I see. Okay, thank you. Another question is about this detector core. Uh, you mentioned uh, the structure. You said that the temperature is a little bit higher than the mixing plate, and then you improve the structure and got a lower. My question is where, uh, it's, this structure is thermalized to the mixing plate, is that correct? That's correct, yes. So where do you think this heat is coming from? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. So, so this was, I must say, this was the older design, right? So I don't actually have a, a picture of the current design it's pretty much the same but this actually temperature is very close to this and so to answer your question up until run 1b when we had this discrepancy it was because this uh this this uh, detector core design was actually not optimal at all uh in in, ter in terms of thermalization and so to answer your question here is the this this is the uh, you know like this detector core and it's thermalized here so that's kind of like the mixing chamber here uh, and also the cavity so you know cavity and the this thing are uh, thermalized at the same plate here so they should technically have the same temperature and that was not seen up until run one B because um, this thing was not you know like optimally um, thermalized around here. So, so that problem has been largely solved now, starting run 1C, where this temperature actually is very close to this. So it mainly comes from the fact that this structure, the older one, was actually not optimal in terms of thermalization. So I see. So I guess the, maybe one of the cables that connect to the hotter stage was it's yes. actually not just, you know, external cable touching or anything. There was no obvious touch that was actually increasing the temperature. Not it's just that... The, yeah. Since the yeah, cables yeah. are connected to the, the hotter stages, maybe the, because the thermalization was lower to the mixing plate, the cable was providing a, uh, some heat to... So, yeah, so, so far, so, you know, like if everything is done you know, like properly, this mm -hmm. is at this is at 100 millikelvin, right? So these right. Uh, these uh, coaxes and also DC lines are thermalized here, so that would be around 100 millikelvin, and then this whole thing will still be on, in 100 millikelvin. So technically, there is no like obvious path that this could be warm, but just because you know it's just like located couple of feet away from like this and then you know it's kind of like also enclosed in this um, mm -hmm. helium reservoir thing one could see like there would be some sort of like temperature gradient if this is actually not optimally thermalized this structure is not optimally thermalized to this um, this uh, this uh, cold finger here right so so I think our uh, work was basically you know 
to to make this thing thermalize better with this uh, and that seems to have actually taken care of this issue largely uh, and there were there were smaller adjustments like you know making sure that um, the spacers that we used, uh, like uh, the, the plastic spacers that we used to isolate this from the helium reservoir, we didn't touch the reservoir and stuff like that. So that might have helped too. So what I wanted to say is like there was no obvious like touch or any gradient that we can think of, but it probably was a combination of like not thermalizing this thing properly to the cold finger plus having some sort of like minute uh, touch of the spacer, spacers with this four Kelvin or something. So I, it, it seems to have largely been taken care of now. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask another one? Yes, please. <laughs> yes. You mentioned this, uh, uh, there's a combination of JPN and travel and wave. Parameters. Yes. So, uh, but um, do you use both of them at the same time or? So, yeah, so um, this traveling with parametric amplifier, um, we are uh, using this with a sidecar cavity right now. Um, and this Josephson parametric amplifier is what uh, we are using with, um, with our main cavity right now. Um, so th there is a little bit of difference in that, that, uh, you know, like traveling with parametric amplifier seems to, first of all, this is actually not available all the way down to like where we are looking at. Um, and also it is, you know, like even though it's noise temperature is supposed to be close to the parametric amplifier, it's not actually clear if that's the case. So yes. this is the first time we're trying to actually um, characterize this. And uh, that was the motivation of um, installing this with the sidecar. Um, in principle, you know, if this works, it would be a broadband thing and that might work. But we are kind of like finding out subtle differences. Like, for example, uh, this uh, uses higher power, at least the one that's designed for us, uh, than this uh, power, meaning pump power. So some of those things we'll have to consider because we have limited volume here. And in order to uh, minimize the pump power, we might have to add like couple of circulators or something. So that might be tricky with the limited volume. So, so this is kind of like an experimental run for a tuba. So who developed the uh, amplifiers? So this one is actually from uh, Irfan Siddiqui from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, but, you know, this is actually in run 1C. So this was from Berkeley, but then now from run 1D uh, or future runs, uh, Washington University, St. Louis is actually making our uh, Josephson parametric amplifier. Actually, I must say like there is a, some transfer of, um, transfer of um, knowledge and um, you know, like some chips to, from Arfan Siddiqui's group to uh, Washington University, St. Louis, I believe. And then they are kind of like packaging and uh, characterizing and stuff like that. Yeah, that, thank you very much for this uh, review. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. I mean, oh, thank you. Yeah, my, yeah. It was my pleasure. Yeah, that was an amazing presentation. I learned so much. Uh, how did the COVID uh, influence the run? Did you manage to have the whole run? In oh, so. We are still in the middle of the run. Um, so you're right, COVID has actually slowed down everything uh, because, uh, you know, like in most of our labs, uh, only essential people are allowed. So that means we're cutting back on personnel who can be there. And also we are cutting back on time, uh, you know, because we are encouraged to just be there for specific tasks and not linger around for too much. So. Right. Uh, very limited people have been going uh, on site and uh, doing work. So it has slowed, you know, things down. But surprisingly, we're actually doing quite well. Like we're actually uh, taking data and um, we, you know, so, so we are actually in the middle of the run and we're trying to uh, address some of the, you know, like Josephson parametric amplifier issues that I mentioned earlier. We're trying to troubleshoot it. So when do you think you reach the goal of the of this run? So we we have reached the DFSC sensitivity. So we are taking data in that sensitivity. 
so you know like because our uh, because of the JPAs our signal to noise ratio is not optimal um, so we'll have to reassess you know like how much signal to noise ratio is actually uh, you know like we, we need and so we are kind of trying to reassess you know like uh, how to how to move forward so that's kind of where we are but we are taking science data right now Great. Uh, so there's more, some, some more questions. Yeah. Sure, yes. Okay, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about your uh, uh, no noise of your amplifier. Yes. It's still a few <coughs> times higher than uh, noise, uh, quantum, quantum noise. Quantum noise, yes. Uh, yes. Could you uh, explain why it's Yes, higher? yeah, so Definitely. So the the main reason is, as I showed you in the picture here, so um, this is actually from run 1B, this temperature here. So the reason that uh, one, uh, yeah, so this is from run 1B. So the reason we are still not in quantum noise limit is this J JPA is actually still in higher temperature than what what would be for quantum noise limit. We'd expect, you know, about like 100 millikelvin or so will give it uh, quantum noise, right? So I think uh, that that's the main reason that we are not actually hitting quantum noise limit. So you said that uh, uh, the troubling way with uh, parametric amplifiers is going to be uh, is 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 be used for sidecar. So yes. Which, yeah, which means you you are taking independently. Uh, the, uh, the data independently, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, um, so very similar to this line, there is a sidecar, you know, like its own lines, and it's pretty much like another experiment, right? So, uh, we spend very minimal time on that because uh, that's not the main focus of uh, ADMX experiment. But it's actually remarkable, like how much information we can get from them that uh, that setup uh, in a very small time. So yes, it has its different lines and we can characterize the amplifiers and stuff like that uh, on sidecar separately. So can you, can you remind, uh, remind us the, the frequency range for the sidecar and then what kind of sensitivity do you expect it is run? Ah, uh, so <clears throat> that's a good question. So uh, there were, I don't have the results here, but um, you know, like I think last year we published sidecar results in like uh, several, like four, uh, five and seven gigahertz regime, and uh, it was at the case uh, VZ level without the quantum amplifiers at that time. Um, so this time around, we're trying to use Tupa, um, and so uh, it's possible that it would be, you know, like more sensitive than that. Um, and I can't tell you on top of my head exactly what frequency we're looking at it right now. But it's it's higher frequency, like uh, like the you know haystack regime. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Oh, I have a one general question. Sure. So, yes. You you show that uh, for ADMX run two, uh, you are investi investigating the full library array, and at the same time, you also mentioned that uh, you are researching in the spoken, spoken thing cavity and also the photon dependent cavity, right? Yes, yes. So uh, what is the typical resonance frequency and the uh, uh, tune-up range for the photonic bandwidth cavity? Oh, so that's a very good point. So I must say, so this is actually an independent work. Um, let me just uh, show you another slide here. So um, this photonic band gap cavity work is actually done by uh, University of Chicago graduate student who is part of ADMX, but this is actually an independent work, not exactly part of ADMX, but ADMX could potentially use. Uh, you know, so he's, he's doing this uh, with this alumina wood pile structure. Um, you know, like, uh, so this is the cavity that he's actually uh, holding here. And so the frequency he's looking at is around this. So he's looking at like 10 gigahertz or so. This is actually motivated by uh, this another experiment, which is actually not part of the um, 
you know, like uh, ADMX experiment. This is more like for the qubit based, um, you know, like a dark matter detection. That's why the frequency is high. But in principle, one can actually go lower and, uh, you know, do similar work for lower frequency too. How do you tune this can be? Um, so that's a good question. So um, I think you just move the rod position. So you just actually, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, move the rod position. Any further questions, comments? Otherwise, let's take a speaker again.